Take your Bible this morning, turn to 1 Timothy chapter number 4. 1 Timothy chapter 4, and look at verse number 7. We're dealing with part num- 1 this morning on a message entitled Gymnastics in Godliness as we continue to preach through the book of 1 Timothy. So look at 1 Timothy 4, look at verse 7. But refuse profane and old wives' fables, and exercise thyself rather unto godliness. For bodily exercise profiteth little, but godliness is profitable unto all things, having promise of the life that now is and of that which is to come. So let's pray. Father, thank you for the morning. Bless our time together in the Word. We pray, Lord, that uh, we might learn some things today that will help us to be better Christians. And, Lord, again, we ask that if someone is here that doesn't know you as Savior, oh, Lord, I pray that today they would open the door of their heart and invite you in and trust you uh, for salvation. In Jesus' name we ask it. Amen. Well, in the last message, Paul instructed Timothy on how to be a good servant of Jesus Christ. That should be the priority of every one of us, to be the best Christian, the best servant of the Lord we can be. Well, in this section, Paul offers instruction on how to make the right kind of choices as you serve the Lord. He tells Timothy what to avoid as well as what to pursue and what is profitable and what is menial. His instructions apply to us too, no matter what age we are. The instructions that Paul provides here talk about gymnastics in godliness. If you love to exercise, to go to the gym, to train, and keep yourself fit as a fiddle, then you will find important truths in this passage about gymnastics in godliness, which are much more important. You know, when I was a boy, we were tested in PE class for the President Physical Fitness Award. Based on our age, weight, and height, we had to meet certain requirements to earn the presidential award. Uh, I don't know if I would earn one now, but I received the blue presidential patch with the gold eagle every year when I was in grade school and junior high. Now this is where you're supposed to say, ooh, Oh, okay. Thank you. That helps me very much. All right. Well, what Paul speaks about here will help you and me to meet the requirements of the Jesus Spiritual Fitness Award as Paul speaks about gymnastics in godliness. So let's begin to see what this is all about. Look at 1 Timothy 4. Look at verse 7 again. We see, first of all, fables to avoid. Look at this. But refuse profane and old wives' fables. Have you ever found yourself in a situation where people were talking about something or someone and it made, it, and it made uh, you uh, feel very uncomfortable or even, even upset you? You did not want to hear it, so you excused yourself from the conversation. You avoided or shunned what was being said in the conversation. Well, that is the idea of the word refuse that's in this verse. Paul told Timothy to refuse some things that would hinder his ministry, his effectiveness, and his service for the Lord. In fact, the word refuse is from the word which means to shun, to avoid, to reject, to 
beg one's pardon to leave, to excuse yourself. That's the idea, the meaning of the Greek word behind this word, refuse. In fact, it's interesting, it's in the present tense, which means we are to continually do this, continually refuse profane and old wives' fables. Uh, what was Timothy to avoid? He says, profane and old wives' fables. Now, what in the world are these? An old wives' tale is a saying, a remedy, or piece of wisdom that is passed down from one generation to the next and is passed down as a fact. The strength of the tale is so powerful that it does not allow facts to get in the way or slow it down. Old wives' tales exist today. Uh, now, you may be familiar with some of these. For example, if you keep crossing your eyes, then they're going to get stuck, all right? Uh, don't swallow your gum because it takes seven years to digest. If you walk under a ladder, something bad is going to happen to you. Here's one. Coffee stunts your growth, or it will put hair on your chest. Well, if that was true, I'd be putting it all over my head right back here. Grow some hair. You know, Paul was referring to tales or myths that were profane. The word profane here is from the word biblios. And it means godless or unholy. It refers to anything that contradicts the scriptures. Uh, it denoted a person who either was or ought to have been debarred from the threshold or the entrance to the Jewish temple. Godless old wise fables or myths were to be shunned or avoided by Timothy as well as us. These are fictional stories that contradict the scriptures. We are to do the same as Timothy. Such stories are a distraction from the truths of the scripture. Of course, in Paul days, a lot of stories went around about the Greek gods and the Roman gods and goddesses that were fables. Those were to be avoided. Uh, a classic example of an old wives' fable today is the teachings of evolution. Folks, you, the world was not made by a big bang. God made it. Uh, you did not come from a monkey or an ape or anything like that. Uh, that is a big joke. In fact, it's interesting when you study all the different theories of evolution, they all contradict one another. So, man, I tell you what, you talk about confused people, they're confused. They're confused because they won't believe the truth of the Scripture that God did it all. He made you and I. He made this world. Well, uh, God provides us several warnings of things that we should avoid for our benefit or our protection. The warnings that give, God gives to us on things to avoid, those warnings are blessings. They are not a curse. If we're to be godly Christians that live for the Lord Jesus Christ, if we are going to honor the Lord with our life, then there are some several things that we need to avoid. And we will note some of them that are mentioned in the Scripture. Number one, avoid companions that are wicked and also their ways. Exodus 23, 2. Thou shalt not follow a multitude to do evil. Proverbs 4, 14 and 15. Enter not into the path of the wicked and go not in the way of evil men. Avoid it. Pass not by it. Turn from it. Pass away. You know, as a senior citizen was driving down the highway, his cell phone rang. Answering the phone, he heard his wife's voice urgently warning him. Hermit! I just heard on the news that there's a car going down the wrong way on Interstate 55. Please be careful. Herman said, what do you mean? It's not just one car. It's hundreds of cars that are going the wrong way. Now, beloved, this 
story illustrates the attitude of many people who are on the wrong path but don't realize it or will not admit it, just like Herman. This is what gets many people into major trouble because the direction they are taking in their lives is a dangerous direction and it's a destructive direction. You can almost hear Solomon shouting out, the path of the wicked is to be avoided like the plague. The king cries out in Proverbs 4, 4, 15, don't enter that path. Don't follow that way. Don't follow the habits, the lifestyle of men who are evil. He cries out, avoid it. Stay away. You know, have you ever flown a kite in the springtime on a windy day? You know, Friday, Friday afternoon would have been a great time to do that. Yeah, amen. What fun it is to fly a kite. Have you ever let go of the string of a kite you were flying or perhaps a helium-filled balloon to see how far or how, how high it will fly? If so... Uh, this is the idea or the picture behind this word avoid in Proverbs 4, 4, 4, and 4, 14 and 15. That word avoid, says he says avoid it. That word avoid is from the word para and it means to ignore it, to let it alone, to loosen or let go, to refrain, stay as far away as you can from the path of wicked people. Don't even get near it. Let go of any desire to pursue or follow such a path. Over and again, Solomon urges us to depart from evil if we are playing around with it. Don't take the first step, for you may not be master of your destiny thereafter. In fact, you may not get a second step. The path of the wicked may seem interesting, intriguing, invigorating, intoxicating, and illuminating. But the king says, don't investigate it at all. God promises his blessings when we avoid this path. Uh, there's something else we're to avoid. Avoid cantankerous troublemakers that cause conflicts. Romans 16, 17. Now I beseech you, therefore, brethren, mark them which cause division and offenses contrary to the doctrine which you have learned, and avoid them. Proverbs 24, 21. My son, fear the Lord and the king, and meddle not with them that are given to change. We are to avoid or meddle not with those who are given to change. Now, what in the world does that mean? The phrase meddle not has two applications. It means to not have fellowship or do not co-sign or take a pledge for them. The phrase given to change is from the word shanan. It means to repeat or do again or to change. This word was used to describe those who were rebellious and repeated their disobedience or they changed that which was good to that which was bad. Stay away from rebels. Rebels attract other rebels. They are like birds of a feather that flock together. If you find yourself attracted to rebellious people, you are already in trouble. Rebellion indicates some spiritual problems that are going on in your heart. Proverbs 17, 11, 
An evil man seeketh only rebellion. Therefore, a cruel messenger shall be sent against him. Now, there's something else that we should avoid. Avoid the carnality, the corruption of sexual immorality, and sensual, lustful companions. 1 Thessalonians 4, 3. For this is the will of God, even your sanctification, that you should abstain from fornication, Paul says. 1 Peter 2, 11. Dearly beloved, I beseech you as strangers and pilgrims, abstain from fleshly lust which war against the soul. You know, beloved, drunkenness is a big factor in why, why many men become involved with sensual, immoral women. Stay away from the booze. Stay away from the drugs. Stay away from those things. Uh, Solomon alludes to this in Proverbs 7.25 when he says, Let not thy heart decline to her ways. Go not astray in her past. He was describing an immoral woman in that passage. The word astray in Proverbs 7.25 is from the word ta, and it means not only to wonder, but to stagger like a drunkard. Alcohol and committed, dedicated Christians for Jesus Christ, they just don't mix, beloved. If you're going to live your life for Christ and be a testimony for Him, you want to stay away from the liquor. Avoid cheating, covenanting, carousing, and condemning people. 1 Corinthians 5.11 But now I have written unto you not to keep company... If any man that is called a brother be a fornicator or covetous or an idolater or a railer or a drunkard or an extortioner, with such a one know not to eat, Paul says. 1 Corinthians 5, 9, I wrote unto you in an epistle not to, to company with fornicators. Proverbs 23, 20. Be not among wine-bibbers, among riotous eaters of flesh. Solomon warns us to avoid carousing and spending time with party animals that are drunkard and gluttons. Now the question is, why? Folks like this are trouble. That's why. Drunkenness and gluttony usually lead to drowsiness and laziness, which in turn leads to a loss of time at work, a loss of pay, perhaps a loss of a job, and eventually, eventually poverty. Liquor creates problems, beloved. A member of Alcoholics Anonymous once sent a, a columnist Ann Landers the following article. It said, we drank for joy and became miserable. We drank for sociability and became argumentative. We drank for friendship and we made enemies. We drank medicinally and acquired health problems. We drank for relaxation and we got the shakes. We drank to make conversation easier, and we slurred our speech. We drank to forget, and were forever haunted. Beloved, excessive eating and drinking are usually symptoms of deeper problems in a person's life. Some people that suffer from sorrow, stress, guilt, or conviction over their sins they turn to alcohol or food to comfort themselves. Solomon instructs us to avoid the constant companionship of people marked by these traits. Something else we're to avoid. We're to avoid contentious, cross people. Proverbs 22, 24. Make no friendship with an angry man and with a furious man Thou shalt not go. 
Angry people tend to do one of two things. They will either repulse others who do not care at all to be around them as they spew out their anger or they will attract others who enjoy arguing and fighting. It'll be one of the two. If your friends are people that are consistently uh, doing this, that they consistently lose their tempers and seem to just be angry all the time, walking around with a chip on their shoulder, and you are not bothered by their behavior, you need to watch out. That is not good. You are getting used to temper tantrums and arguing. This behavior is becoming normal to you, and that is where you get into trouble. It's not normal behavior to have that kind of attitude and be fussing and fighting all the time. This is why Solomon clearly and firmly states that we are not to go with this kind of person because we can end up learning and being influenced by his ways. Angry people stir up strife. They stir up division. You know, getting in the habit of losing your temper and fighting can ensnare, it can entrap you possibly to incarceration in a jail cell. Avoid hotheads and realize that your own anger and temper tantrums not only affect you, they affect the people who are around you. A friend of Philip Yancey had a marriage that had gone through rough times. One night, George passed a breaking point and he emotionally exploded. He pounded the table, stomped on the floor. He said, I hate you. He screamed this at his wife. I'm not going to take it anymore. I've had enough. I won't go on. I won't let it happen. No, 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 no more. Several months later, his friend woke up in the middle of the night and he heard a strange sound coming from the room where his two-year-old son slept. He got up and he went down the hall and he stood outside the, the door of his little boy and shivers ran through his flesh that left him sick to his stomach. Well, what in the world did he hear from his son's room in the middle of the night? In a soft voice, the two-year-old was repeating word for word with precise inflection the climatic argument between his mother and his father. The little boy was saying, I hate you. I won't take it anymore. No, no, no. Words like this coming from the mouth of a toddler were like shotgun blast to him because the daddy knew he was the one that pulled the trigger. He spoke these words which were engraved into his son's memory. George realized that in some awful way he had just passed on his pain, his anger, and lack of forgiveness to the next generation. Is not that what is happening right now all over this world? Are you passing on to your family your bitterness, anger, or perhaps your rebellion against God? Are there things in your life you need to remove right now to avoid in your life? Are there bad habits or addictions you, you need to break? If so, ask God for His mercy and grace and His power. Lord, break these chains in my life. 
God, help me to overcome these things. I know they're wrong. Oh, God, help me. Help me. Cry out to him. You know what? You'll be amazed at what the Lord can do for you as a Christian. Many Christians struggle with things today, and they need to get some things out of their life. They need to give God the garbage that's in their life, as Joe Mark would say. Uh, God help us to live a godly life. Maybe you're here this morning, and you don't have a clue where you would spend eternity if that tornado that came through Friday night killed you, like some of the people in our area. If that happened, if you were killed by a, that tornado that came through here Friday night and you died, would you be in heaven or hell right now? Where are you going to spend eternity? You say, well, I hope I'm going to heaven. Well, I'll tell you what, that's not good enough. You can hope all that you want, but that doesn't mean you're going to go there. But I'm going to tell you something. You can know you're going to heaven. You can know that. God has told us in his word. He wants us to know that. Man, that's where the joy and the peace and the security come from. Knowing you're ready to go. Knowing that. You can know by asking Jesus Christ to forgive you and cleanse you of all your sins. Do that. Turn from that sin. Repent of it. And put your faith and trust in Him to save your soul and give you eternal life. Put the care of your soul into His hands. And the Bible says if you will do that, He will keep His promise, He will keep His word, He will clean you up, He will forgive you, and He will give you His gift of eternal life if you'll put your faith and trust in Him. You know, you can leave church today knowing you're on your way to heaven. If you didn't know that walking through the doors, you can leave that way if you'll trust the Savior. I'm not talking about joining the church here, folks. No, 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 no. I'm talking about asking the Son of God to cleanse you and forgive you and become your Savior. If you do that, He'll save your soul. Man, I'll tell you what, what a Savior we have. If you need to make some decisions today. Maybe there's some things as a Christian you need to get right with the Lord, then get them right. You're in a church of a lot of people who have had to get something right with God. Get them right and do your best to go forward for Jesus Christ. And if you don't know the Savior, invite him into your heart today.